Well, good evening, Mount Pleasant. Uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, if you will, go ahead and turn with me to Leviticus um, chapter number 11. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 44 and 45 um, this afternoon. Uh, we'll look at a couple of other places um, in Exodus, uh, but we'll primarily be there in Leviticus uh, chapter number 11. So if you will, just turn with me there, uh, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So uh, this morning, um, we were in First Peter um, chapter number 1, verses 13 through 16. And so we really, uh, as you know, have been talking about God's mercy as it, uh, as it applies to um, our past and future. So we've been looking at God's mercy as it applies to our justification and also um, our glorification in the future. Uh, but we'll deal primarily now, or we did this morning, with our sanctification, with our growth in holiness. And this is what um, we dealt with this morning. This is what we're going to see. We're going to look at the foundation um, for that call to holiness. And we, so we saw this morning that um, as, New uh, as New Testament believers, as the church, we are the, we are the new covenant people. We are a new family um, and as that new family, there are responsibilities for each individual. And so as individuals in this new family, uh, we're to live holy lives. And so we talked about um, the connection of setting our hope, our hope fully on the promises of God. And we talked about how we do that by thinking actively and clearly about what God has done for us. Uh, we talked about how we are a people that have been born again. And because of that, we are not to be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. Instead, this is the foundation for why we are to be holy for why, for God is holy. And so we talked a little bit uh, this morning about how Peter um, applies Old Testament images um, throughout uh, the end of 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and the start of 1 Peter chapter number 2. Um, he, he applies these Old Testament images to these elect exiles, signifying them as the people of God, the true people of God. And although there, there were many places in the Old Testament, or there are many places in the Old Testament, uh, where God commands his people to be holy, uh, we identified this morning Leviticus 11.44 as one of those uh, foundational texts. Uh, for Israel's call to be holy, and then by extension, this um, us as the uh, spiritual Israel to be holy as well. So we talked about that briefly, but I want to really go uh, in depth there um, tonight. I want to dive into the the context surrounding uh, that prime that 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 foundational text there in Leviticus. 11. Uh, I want to talk about just simply, you know, why it was commanded of Israel, um, you know, how they were to carry out that, that command, um, how it relates to us as new covenant believers here and now in our present context. Uh, so we'll look at some of those things um, tonight. But just by way of introduction, um, I wonder how many, and I can't do a show of hands because we're online, obviously, but I wonder how many people when I said Leviticus, um, uh, maybe you're not even here anymore. Maybe you clicked off. <laughs> or uh, I wonder how many people thought, uh, you know, I wish you'd have said something other than Leviticus, right? Um, typically, you know, unfortunately, uh, the idea surrounding Le Leviticus is that it's, um, it's, it's boring, right? It's boring. There's a lot of things we don't really understand. It's, it's, um, it's, it's real tedious to try to get through. And, um, you know, I think because of that, uh, that that preconceived notion that we bring to Leviticus that this is probably one of the most neglected books um, in the Bible. Um, there's all these ceremonial laws and rules and regulations and rituals and all these things. So you know what does that have to do with us? Oftentimes the uh, what what we go to, to to sort of avoid Leviticus is to say, well, none of that applies to us anymore. Uh, none of it applies to us anymore. We don't have to worry about that. And so in a sense, yes, ceremonial law and these things like this don't apply to us and that we don't do them. The theological background for these things um, certainly applies and has, has vast implications uh, for our lives now. So, so we don't want to uh, just do what we typically do with Bible reading, how uh, we come to Leviticus. Uh, we've been trying to read through Scripture and we get to Leviticus and we... Uh, 
either stop there and start, you know, next year, or we get there and uh, we skip it. All right, we don't want to do that uh, with Leviticus. What we're going to do if we do that is we're going to miss some very important theological points that are very relevant for us uh, today. Very important connections um, if we skip. Leviticus. We've missed the connection between God's presence with his people in the tabernacle, how this applies to us now through Christ, the, the, the manifestation of God's presence, uh, you know, where he came to tabernacle with us, right? We see uh, the foundations for Christ's future incarnation in Leviticus then. And uh, we, you know, if we skip it, we see, we miss the importance of uh, the, the foundations of the sacrificial system in Leviticus, which obviously has future ramifications for us when it comes to Christ's sacrifice on the cross, that once-for-all sacrifice. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, you know, where his blood cleanses us uh, from sin and also sanctifies us. Um, now, we could go, obviously, more in-depth with each one of those, but for the purposes tonight, as we consider where we were this morning, we're going to spend all of our time tonight looking at that command in Leviticus 11, 44 through 45 from God towards his people, calling them to holiness. Uh, this command is uh, reiterated to us, certainly, as the New Covenant people. We see that there in First Peter. Um, it's vitally important, then, for us to understand where this command originated, why it was given, how it's to be accomplished, and, and certainly how it's relevant um, for us today. So just looking first at the original command, we... We see this passage um, in near the end of Moses' uh, discussion of the Israelites' dietary regulations, and it's set within this wider context of his discussion on the difference between those things that are clean and unclean in the Israelites' everyday life, and certainly that had implications for their uh, ceremonial uh, purity or defilement. Uh, one way or another, obedience or disobedience to that. And so in the midst of that, God really gives us the foundation. He provides the reason why um, we are to uh, obey these commands, or why Israel were to obey those commands. And it says this, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves or consecrate yourselves, set yourselves apart. And you do that. You, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. For I am the Lord that brings you up, or brought you up, out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So this is the reason why. This is where we find the original command. Why all these dietary regulations? Why all these things about clean, unclean? Why this that, do that, do that, eat this, not, don't eat that. Why these rules and regulations? And the Lord says this, do it in order for you, you do this in order to be holy like I am holy. Harrison writes like this, for the ancient Hebrews to be holy, distinctive and priestly in character was not an abstract ideal, but an attainable reality that had practical dimensions in everyday life. The law, therefore, furnishes detailed guidelines for the benefit of the community so that all possible forms of defilement might be avoided. So why these rules and regulations? To avoid defilement, to, to be holy, to be, uh, to be underneath um, Yahweh, for him to be our God and for us to be uh, his people. And so this is why we find that command from God to sanctify or consecrate yourself. God is calling Israel here to separate themselves from those things that he considers unclean in order that they may serve him and imitate his holiness. And, and now it seems simple enough, but, but we really need to dive deeper into the reasons why God calls them into this separation. Why the do this and not do that, eat this, not eat that, and all these things. Certainly it is so that they would be holy, and we don't want to understate or undervalue that. Um, but, but why? What is the purpose? Why does, why does God, more fundamentally, why does he want them to be holy? That's going to have individual uh, implications for our lives, certainly, but it also has universal implications. Um, implications for the world. And we see this um, in the next passage. We see it in Exodus 19.6. So 
these laws and regulations that we've you know that we find this this command to be holy we find it in that context of these uh, these laws there in Leviticus they're, they're practical extensions of who Israel was called to be after the Exodus and so the, these are just uh, practical ways of showing that that because God has brought them out of Israel or, or out of Egypt uh, through the Exodus they are to be a certain type of people they are to be identified as people that live under God's commands and his rules and his regulations and what he says, right? And so in Leviticus 11.45, we see that foundation. We see that Israel was called to be holy in one sense because God had brought them up out of the land of Egypt to be their God. As Harrison notes, he says this, God makes it clear that the Israelites are to be a distinctive spiritual body of which he is the undisputed head. Holiness must therefore be the watchword of personal and national life alike. And so this holiness, it was a call to Israel, as Harrison says, Israel's national identity, but but a personal identity uh, as well. And so part of their holiness then uh, was their separateness uh, from, from the wicked, idolatrous, nations around them, those that didn't know Yahweh, right, the covenant God of Israel, those that didn't uh, didn't worship him. Um, so in Exodus 19.6 then, God makes clear that when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, they were to be a certain type of people, uh, a certain type of nation. God makes clear here in Exodus 19.6 the, the benefits of the Exodus for Israel, but not just their benefits, but the benefits of the nation. So certainly Israel is going to benefit from being brought out of slavery and oppression uh, there in Egypt, but the nations are going to benefit as well. It seems odd to think that the benefits will, that the, the nations will benefit from Israel being separate, right? From being separate from them. But look at how this works. The Lord here in Exodus 19, 6, he speaks to Moses and he says this, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. We see this, and we see God bringing Israel to Himself. And who is God? He is ultimate holiness, right? All perfections. Uh, There, there is nothing. He can't be in the presence there uh, of sin. That's where we see the sacrificial system. Um, come into play. So certainly, if he is going to be their God and they're going to be his people, then they should be the type of people that grow in holiness, right? To be able to to come into his presence. So, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, so we see this idea of obedience, of, of keeping the covenant, of, of doing what God says. What does he say? You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words uh, that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And so as this kingdom of priests, as this holy nation, Israel was to be God's representative to uh, the surrounding nations. Uh, Israel was to be God's uh, 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 representative. They were to be a city on a hill. They were uh, to be a light that would draw the nations to Israel and to Israel's God. So this starts to, to make sense, doesn't it? Israel should look differently. They should live uh, this this separate life. Why? In order that what? The blessings of the covenant would come to them and that the nations around them would say, you know, why is this happening? You know, why is why is Israel prospering in such a way that they are? And they come. They 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 they, they the nations are drawn to Israel. Why? So that Israel can then say, it is because of Yahweh, right? And so it's a way, it's, a, it's, it's almost a missional text here. Not missional in the sense of how we think of missional as going to the nations, but missional in the sense that they live so differently that the nations will be drawn um, to them. And so then part of this, this distinctiveness 
um, how they were to be distinct was to be seen in their obedience to this 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 different set of rules and, and regulations, right? So in Deuteronomy four six, we read that the laws will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So it, it makes sense then to be a holy nation, uh, to be a nation that is separate, that lives differently, that would naturally draw people, right? That, that should draw these nations that see the prosperity there. And say, why is this coming to them? Why is it coming to this people? It was because of Yahweh, right? It's because of, of his benefits and his blessings that come through that covenant relationship. And so on top of that, it, it makes sense then to be a holy nation, uh, a nation that would bring glory to God through their obedience and through their witness uh, you know, to the, to the nations around them. It makes sense that all of her inhabitants, all of Israel's inhabitants, would need to be holy as well, right? This is where obedience to God's law was crucial. However, it's clear that the law could never, and we, 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 we know this well as we read Paul, as we read um, his writings, um, and, and we see it certainly in the, the failure of it to ever bring forth true holiness to Israel. It's clear that the law could never in itself bring about the intended holiness required. Right? As Jesus would later clarify, it's not what goes in but comes out that defile, defiles a man. And this is not God setting Israel up for failure. This is getting them to understand and to realize that something better is coming. They should look to something else. And so concerning this, Benjamin Shaw writes this about the fact that um, uh, it, it's not what goes in but what's, what comes out that defiles a man about the true purpose of the law and, the, and the, the, the commands, Benjamin Shaw says this, Jesus is telling the people that those laws of clean and unclean were intended to be a picture that showed them that the totality of their lives was, by nature, unclean. Uncleanness was not sin, but it was a picture of sin, as it was almost impossible to get through a day in ancient Israel without contracting some sort of uncleanness the Lord, by these laws, was showing how thoroughly sin had corrupted human life. There was really no escaping it. He says, in reality, their hope was not to avoid uncleanness. Instead, their hope was to be delivered from it. As the author of Hebrews says, the blood of bulls and goats only sanctified for the purification of the flesh. It is only the blood of Christ that cleanses our consciences from dead works to the true service of the living God. And so, in short, Israel's failure to, to truly be holy and the failure of the sacrificial system to keep them holy was to point to something better, to point to a true Savior, a true uh, one that was truly holy, one that was uh, truly uh, a perfect sacrifice. And so it was pointing them, it was getting, getting them to look forward to a, a new, a better, a perfect Savior, which obviously we know uh, to be Jesus. And so here's where we begin to hopefully see the connection between um, this ancient call uh, to holiness in the life of historical Israel and then the call in First Peter to, a, to, to spiritual Israel to, to, to be the new covenant people of God that are holy. And so the call to holiness, we see, is, is rooted in, in God's past action on behalf of a chosen people. This is not this call from that we see in 1 Peter is not something that just randomly pops up out of the blue. It's firmly rooted in what God has been doing throughout the course uh, of his redemptive plan, right? The call to holiness is rooted then in God's past action on behalf of a chosen people. A people that were called by God. We think of Abraham in Genesis 12. Uh, people that were rescued by God. Think of, of uh, ex the, the exodus bringing out of slavery. Uh, a people called to live in relationship with God, to be a witness to the nations. Think Exodus 19. A covenant people who, who were called to live in obedience to their God. And, and they were essentially, uh, as we look at it, they were to look back at what God had done for them in order to move them forward in their love and their obedience toward Him so that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And, and we see such a similarity here 
with 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. We talked about it this morning. We don't have to go in depth with it here. We were to prepare our minds, gird up our loins, prepare for action, right? We're to actively and clearly think about what? About what God had done for us in the past. He started there in verse 13 with, therefore, do this in light of what I've just said. So what did, what did, he, what did he just said there in 3 through 5? He talks about you know, God's mercy causing us to be born again through the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ to an inheritance that is you know, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for us who are being guarded by uh, the power of God unto salvation. Think about all those things. Remember that. In order, what? That you may set your hope fully on Christ and live presently in that hope and in that holiness, right? In that set-apartedness, if that's a word. Why? That we may be able to go forth into this world as a chosen race, as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation, as a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim, he says, the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into this marvelous light. You see, we can't skip over parts of the Old Testament that seem boring to us. We can't skip over a passage that is such so rich in theology like this of Leviticus 11, 44 through 45, because in it we see the connection. We see the fact that we too have been brought out of slavery, the slavery of sin and, and death. We've had our own exodus. Right? We've been brought out of the darkness into this marvelous light. Right? And, and we are, 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 we're, we're, we're brought out primarily not through what we have done, but only through that once and for all sacrifice of Christ. Right? It's not that we brought ourselves out and that we continue to be sanctified in our own strength. It is because of what Christ has done that has set us right, that has declared us holy and righteous. And as such, we are to live out that calling as, as holy people, as those that are living in conformity to God's will and, and God's ways, in order that we may grow into that calling as God's people and as a blessing to the nations. And this is not according to our own strength. It is according to the, to the fact that the Holy Spirit is living within us and empowering us to do this very thing. So as we consider this text, as we consider where we were this morning, as we consider this call to holiness, it's really a call, a call to, um, to sanctification, which is the same, you know, sanctify yourselves. We're to, we're to grow in holiness. And so sanctification, it's, it's not a side issue in the Christian life. We, we often think of it as, as some, as simply a doctrine of our faith as something uh, almost like is something that is um, uh, not not um, not mandatory, right? It's it's something that we can do if we would like to, but we don't really have to, right? This is not the case. Sanctification, it's the overarching goal, right? It's the overarching goal of the Christian life that of bringing our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit into more perfect conformity to the will and the ways of God, what for our benefit certainly but also for the benefit of others, for the benefit of the nations, right? All to the glory of the one who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the call tonight, just as it was in 1 Peter, just as it was to the Israelites in Leviticus 11, the call to us today is very simple. Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that your commands to us are rooted in a rich history. Uh, it is rooted in the fact that from the very beginning you have, um, you have been rescuing and redeeming your people. We thank you that you sent your Son to be that perfect sacrifice, that we may be holy, that through his power we may be sanctified and growing in that holiness. We certainly, we, we certainly look back and we're grateful for the hope that we have that is rooted in Christ's past activity. Uh, we thank you for what that means for us in the future. But here and now, Father, in these lives as we walk through this world as elect exiles, help us, Father, to be holy as you are holy. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.